find out what else State Farm agents can do for you. At nope. And welcome to another episode of Carbs, the only show where I sit in a car and BS while consuming carbs. Matt Zion here. We are back at McDonald's for day two. Uh, if you missed the first day, the link will be down below in the description. Uh, we did the Snickerdoodle McFlurry. Pretty good, by the way. Uh, this new item is the Bacon Barbecue Burger. Here's a description off of BrandEating.com. The Bacon Barbecue Burger features a quarter pound cooked to order fresh beef patty, apple wood smoked bacon, bourbon barbecue sauce, two slices of American cheese, and crispy fried onion strings on a toasted artisan roll. It sounds uh, a little like a pared down version of the Bacon Smokehouse Burger. I was thinking about that. I was like, they just released uh, a burger that was very similar in, in name at least to this. So, like, I don't... <sighs> McDonald's always, always releases stuff that it's just like, it's not impressive. Like, it's like, everybody else already has this. What are you doing? Oh, and they made it horribly, too. Oh, God. It's falling apart. Hold on. I'm going to try to correct correct the ship. Oh, it's hot as fuck. Ah, it's hot as burns! There is our burger. And actually, I mean, they stacked it at least. I got the double. Boom, shakalaka. All right. Uh, we should probably get a picture. Oh my god, it's so greasy. All right, let's do it. You know what? That's really good. I think that might be one of the better... Um, one of the better burgers released by McDonald's in quite some time, actually. Barbecue sauce doesn't taste like the usual barbecue sauce. The uh, bacon is nice and crispy. Uh, I do like the fact that the buns aren't particularly... And this might not be the case for everything, but the buns aren't... They're not large. <laughs> They're not taking up too much space. Uh, they complement instead of dominate. This thing is impossible to keep together, though. Uh, but wow, it's good. And the uh, onion strings, very tasty. Meat cooked pretty good. Uh, it doesn't taste as good as the rest of it, but still pretty good. All right, let's get one more big ass bite. Last bite wasn't as good as the first two because I didn't get as much barbecue sauce. That sauce really does carry that burger across the, the finish line. By the way, totally off topic. I drove out to my favorite dispensary uh, for, for marijuana. They, they closed. They closed them. Mm. Oh, it's so, I'm so angry. They, they easily had the best deals on edibles. Oh my God, it was just incredible. I like the deals that they had. They're gone forever, it sucks. And you'll never know why. Like, they just always just vanish, so. Mm. The journey continues to find a new one. Burger is pretty good overall. Uh, I, I don't think that it's incredible by any means. I still would rather get Carl's Jr. Uh, but I would compare it to some of the uh, stuff released recently from Burger King. So, I mean, at least it's on par with that. I'm gonna rate it a very low four out of five matte faces. Um, it, like I said, it gets the job done. Uh, but I just really don't understand how this is any different or special than any other burger. Like, how is this new? This just feels like something that they should have just been offering, like, all the time, I guess. But, hey, that's, uh, McDonald's for you. What are your thoughts on this? Let me know in the comments down below. And here's a question for you. What's your favorite item on the McDonald's menu? of all time. I'm probably gonna go with their nuggets. More than likely their nuggets would win. Fries would be like a close second. Maybe also the uh, the hash browns in the morning, the, uh, the grease sponges. But that's that guys. If you can give this video a thumbs up, it would help significantly as well as going on to uh, Twitter and retweeting this if you enjoyed the video or any of our videos that we do. Uh, retweeting that stuff and hitting like on it and whatnot. It helps. For some reason, YouTube's algorithm enjoys that stuff, so who, who knows? Thank you guys so much for watching. Have a wonderful day, and we'll see you soon. Bye. Introduction of the Mummy, a tale of the 22nd century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amy Graymore The Mummy, A Tale of the Twenty-Second Century By Jane Loudon Introduction I have long wished to write a novel, but I could not determine what it was to be about. I could not bear anything commonplace, and I did not know what to do for a hero. Heroes are generally so much alike 
so monotonous, so dreadfully insipid, so completely brothers of one race, with the family likeness so amazingly strong. This will not do for me, thought I, as I sauntered listlessly down a shady lane one fine evening in June. I must have something new, something quite out of the beaten path. But what? Ah, that was the question. In vain did I rack my brains. In vain did I search the storehouse of my memory. I could think of nothing that had not been thought of before. It is very strange, said I as I walked faster, as though I hoped the rapidity of my motion would shake off the sluggishness of my imagination. It was all in vain. I struck my forehead and called wit to my assistance. But the malignant deity was deaf to my entreaty. Surely, thought I, the deep mine of invention cannot be worked out. There must be some new ideas left, if I could but find them. To find them, however, was the difficulty. Thus lost in meditation, I walked onwards till I reached the brow of a hill, and a superb prospect burst upon me. A fertile valley richly wooded, studded with sumptuous villas and romantic cottages, and watered by a noble river, that wound slowly its lazy course along, spread beneath my feet, and lofty hills swelling to the skies, their summit lost in the clouds, bounded the horizon. The sun was setting in all its splendor, and its lingering rays gave those glowing tints and deep masses of shadow to the landscape, that sometimes produce so magical an effect. It was quite a Claude Lorraine scene, and more fully to enjoy it I entered a hayfield and seated myself upon a grassy bank. The day had been sultry, and the evening breeze as it murmured through the foliage felt cool and refreshing. It is a lovely world, thought I, notwithstanding all that cynics can say against it. Our own passions bring misery upon our heads, and then we rail at the world, though we only are in fault. Why should I seek to wander in the regions of fiction? Why not enjoy tranquilly the blessings heaven has bestowed upon me? I felt too indolent to answer my own question. A delicious stillness crept over my senses, and the heaving chaos of my ideas was lulled to repose. A majestic oak stretched its gnarled arms in sullen dignity above my head. Myriads of busy insects buzzed around me, and woodbines and wild roses, hanging from every hedge, mingled their perfume with that of the new-mown hay. I reclined languidly on my grassy couch, listening to the indistinct hum of the distant village, and feeling that delightful sense of exemption from care, which a faint murmur of bustle afar off gives to the weary spirit, when suddenly the bells struck up a joyous peal, the cheerful notes now swelling loudly upon the ear, then sinking gently away with the retiring breeze, and then again returning with added sweetness. I listened with delight to their melody, till their softness seemed to increase. The sounds became gradually fainter and fainter. The landscape faded from my sight. A soft languor crept over me. In short, I slept. It would be of no use to go to sleep without dreaming, and accordingly I had scarcely closed my eyes when methought a spirit stood before me. His head was crowned with flowers, his azure wings fluttered in the breeze, and a light drapery, like the fleecy vapor that hangs upon the summit of a mountain, floated round him. In his hand he held a scroll, and his voice sounded soft and sweet as the liquid melody of the nightingale. Take this, he said, smiling benignantly. It is the chronicle of a future age. Weave it into a story. It will so far gratify your wishes as to give you a hero totally different from any hero that ever appeared before. You hesitate, continued he again smiling and regarding me earnestly. I read your thoughts and see you fear to sketch the scenes of which you are to write, because you imagine they must be different from those with which you are acquainted. This is a natural distrust. The scenes will indeed be different from those you now behold. The whole face of society will be changed. New governments will have arisen. Strange discoveries will be made. 
and stranger modes of life adopted. The restless curiosity and research of man will then have enabled him to lift the veil from much which is, to him at least, at present a mystery, and his powers, both as regards mechanical agency and intellectual knowledge, will be greatly enlarged. But even then, in the plenitude of his acquirements, he will be made conscious of the infirmity of his nature, and will be guilty of many absurdities, which, in his less enlightened state, he would feel ashamed to commit. To no one but yourself has this vision been revealed. Do not fear to behold it. Though strange, it may be fully understood, for much will still remain to connect that future age with the present. The impulses and feelings of human creatures must, for the most part, be alike in all ages. Habits vary, but nature endures. And the same passions were delineated, the same weaknesses ridiculed by Aristophanes, Plautus, and Terence, as in after times were described by Shakespeare and Moliere, and as will be in the times of which you are to write, by authors yet unknown. But still you hesitate? You object that the novelty of the illusions perplexes you? This is quite a new kind of delicacy, as authors seldom trouble themselves to become acquainted with a subject before they begin to write upon it. However, since you are so very scrupulous, I will endeavor, if possible, to assist you. Look around. I did so, and saw, as in a magic glass, the scenes and characters which I shall now endeavor to pass before the eyes of the reader. Chapter 1, Volume 1 of The Mummy, A Tale of the Twenty-Second Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arnie Hort. The Mummy, A Tale of the Twenty-Second Century by Jane Loudon. Chapter 1, Volume 1. In the year 2126, England enjoyed peace and tranquility under the absolute dominion of a female sovereign. Numerous changes had taken place for some centuries in the political state of the country, and several forms of government had been successfully adopted and destroyed, till, as is generally the case after violent revolutions, they all settled down into an absolute monarchy. The religion of the country was mutable as its government, and in the end, by adopting Catholicism, it seemed to have arrived at nearly the same result. Despotism in the state, indeed, naturally produces despotism in religion. The implicit faith and passive obedience required in the one case, being the best of all possible preparatives for the absolute submission of both mind and body necessary in the other. In former times, England had been blessed with a mixed government and a tolerant religion, under which the people had enjoyed as much freedom as they perhaps ever can do, consistently with their prosperity and happiness. But it is not in the nature of the human mind to be contented. We must always either hope or fear, and things that at distance appear so much more beautiful than they do when we approach them, that we always fancy what we have not, infinitely superior to anything we have, and neglect enjoyments within our reach, to pursue others which, like ignis fatui, elude our grasp at the very moment when we hope we have attained them. Thus it was with the people of England, not satisfied with being rich and prosperous, they longed for something more. Abundance of wealth caused wild schemes and gigantic speculations, and though many failed, yet, as some succeeded, the enormity of the sums gained by the projectors incited others to pursue the same career. New countries were discovered and civilized. The whole earth was brought to the highest pitch of cultivation. Every corner of it was explored. Mountains were leveled. Mines were excavated, and the globe wrecked to its center. Nay, the air and sea did not escape, and all nature was compelled to submit to the overwhelming supremacy of man. Still, the English people were not satisfied. Enabled to gratify every wish till society succeeded indulgence, they were still unhappy, perhaps precisely because they had no longer any difficulties to encounter. Education became universal, and the technical terms of abstruse sciences familiar to the lower mechanics, whilst questions of religion, politics, 
and metaphysics agitated by them daily supplied that stimulus for which their minds enervated by over cultivation constantly craved the consequences may be readily conceived it was impossible for those to study deeply who had to labor for their daily bread and not having time to make themselves masters of any given subject they only learned enough of all to render them disputatious and discontented their heads were filled with words to which they affixed no definite ideas and the little sense heaven had blessed them with was lost beneath a mass of undigested and misapplied knowledge conceit inevitably leads to rebellion the natural consequence of the mob thinking themselves as wise as their rulers was that they took the first convenient opportunity that offered to jostle these aforesaid rulers from their seats an aristocracy was established and afterward a democracy but both shared the same fate for the leaders of each in turn found the instruments they had made use of to rise soon become unmanageable the people had tasted the sweets of power they had learned their own strength they were enlightened and fancying they understood the art of ruling as well as their quondam directors they saw no reason why after shaking off the control of one master they should afterwards submit to the domination of many we are free said they we acknowledge no laws but those of nature and of those we are as competent to judge as our would-be masters in what are they superior to ourselves nature has been as bountiful to us as to them and we have had the same advantages of education why then should we toil to give them ease we are each capable of governing ourselves why should we pay them to rule us why should we be debarred from mental enjoyments and condemned to manual labor are not our tastes as refined as theirs and our minds as highly cultivated will we assert our independence and throw off the yoke if any man wish for luxuries let him labor to procure them for himself we will be slaves no longer we will all be masters thus they reasoned and thus they acted till government after government having been overturned complete anarchy prevailed and the people began to discover though alas too late that there was little pleasure in being masters when there were no subjects and that it was impossible to enjoy intellectual pleasures whilst each man was compelled to labor for his daily bread this was however inevitable for as perfect equality had been declared of course no one would condescend to work for his neighbor and everything was done badly as however skillful any man may be in any particular art or profession it is quite impossible he can excel in all in the meantime the people who had though they scarcely knew why attached to the idea of equality that of exemption from toil found to their infinite surprise that their burthens had increased tenfold whilst their comforts had unaccountably diminished in the same proportion the blessings of civilization were indeed fast slipping away from them every man became afraid lest the hard-earned means of existence should be torn from his grasp for as all laws had been abolished the strong tyrannized over the weak and the most enlightened nation in the world was in imminent danger of degenerating into a horde of rapacious barbarians this state of things could not continue and the people finding from experience that perfect equality was not quite the most enviable mode of government began to suspect that a division of labor and a distinction of ranks were absolutely necessary to civilization and sought out their ancient nobility to endeavor to restore something like order to society these illustrious personages were soon found those who had not emigrated had retired to their seats in the country where surrounded by their dependents and the few friends who had remained faithful to them they enjoyed the otium cum dignitate and consoled themselves for the loss of their former greatness by railing it most manfully at those who had deprived them of it amongst this number was the lineal descendant of the late royal family and to him the people now resolved humbly and unconditionally to offer the crown imagining with the usual vehemence and inconsistency of, of popular commotions that an arbitrary government must be best for them as being the very reverse of that the evils of which they had just so forcibly experienced the prince however to whom a deputation from the people made this offer happened not to be ambitious like another cincinnatus he placed all his happiness in the cultivation of a small farm and had sufficient prudence to reject a grandeur which he felt must be purchased by the sacrifice of his peace the deputies were in despair at his refusal and they re-urged their suit with every argument that the stress of their situation could inspire 
they painted in glowing colors the horrors of the anarchy that prevailed the misery of the kingdom the despair of the people and at last wound up their arguments by a solemn appeal to heaven that if he persisted in his refusal the future wretchedness of the people might fall upon his head the prince continued inexorable and the deputies were preparing to withdraw when the prince's daughter who had been present during the whole interview rushed forward and prevented their retreat stay i will be your queen cried she energetically i will save my country or perish in the attempt the princess was a beautiful woman about six and twenty and at this moment her fine eyes sparkling with enthusiasm her cheeks glowing and her whole face and figure breathing dignity from the exalted purpose of her soul she appeared to the deputies almost as a supernatural being and regarding her offer as a direct inspiration from heaven they bore her in triumph to the assembled multitude who awaited their return whilst the people ever caught by novelty and desirous of any change to free them from the misery they were enduring hailed her appearance with delight and unanimously proclaimed her queen the new sovereign soon found the task she had undertaken a difficult one but happening luckily to possess common sense and prudence united with a firm and active disposition she contrived in time to restore order and to confirm her own power whilst she contributed to the happiness of her people the face of the kingdom rapidly changed security produced improvement and the self-banished nobles of the former dynasty crowding round the new queen she chose from amongst them the wisest and most experienced for her counsellors and by their help compounded an excellent code of laws this book was open to the whole kingdom and cases being decided by principle instead of precedent litigation was almost unknown for as the laws were fully and clearly explained so as to be understood by every body few dared to act in open violation of them punishment being certain to follow detection and all the agonizing delights of a lawsuit were entirely destroyed as every body knew the moment the facts were stated how it would inevitably terminate this renewal of the golden age continued several years without interruption the people being too much delighted with the personal comforts they enjoyed to complain of the errors inseparable from all human institutions whilst the remembrance of what they had suffered during the reign of anarchy made them tremble at a change and patiently submit to trifling inconveniences to avoid the risk of positive evils this generation passed away and with it died not only the recollection of the past misfortunes of the kingdom but also a spirit of content they had engendered a new race arose who with the ignorance and presumption of inexperience found fault with everything they did not understand and accused the queen and her ministers of dotage merely because they did not accomplish impossibilities the government however was too firmly established to be easily shaken the judicious economy of the queen had filled her treasury with riches her prudent regulations had extended the commerce of her subjects to an almost incredible extent whilst her firm and disciplined disposition made her universally respected both at home and abroad the malcontents were therefore awed into submission and obliged in spite of themselves to rest satisfied with growling at the government they were not strong enough to overturn at this time the queen died and the state of affairs experienced an important change it has been before mentioned that the religion of the country had altered with its government atheism rational liberty and fanaticism had followed each other in regular succession and the people found by fatal experience that persecution and bigotry assimilated as naturally with infidelity as with superstition a fixed government seemed to require an established religion and the multitude ever in extremes rushed from excess of liberty to intolerance the catholic faith was restored new saints were canonized and confessors appointed in the families of every person of distinction these priests however were far from having the power they had possessed in former times the eyes of men had been too long opened to be easily closed again education still continued amongst the lower classes and though at the time this history commences it was going out of fashion with persons of rank its influence was even felt by those most prejudiced against it during the reign of the late queen the minds of the public not having any state of affairs to occupy them had been directed to the improvement of the arts and sciences and so many new inventions had been struck out so many wonderful discoveries made 
and so many ingenious contrivances put into execution that poor nature seemed to be degraded from her throne and usurping man to have stepped up to supply her place before the queen died she chose her niece claudia to succeed her and as she enacted that none of her successors should marry she ordered that all future queens should be chosen by the people from such female members of her family as might be between twenty and twenty-five years of age at the time of the thrones becoming vacant every male throughout the kingdom who had attained the age of twenty-one was to have a voice in this election but as it was presumed it might be inconvenient to convoke these numerous electors into one place it was agreed that every ten thousand should choose a deputy to proceed to london to represent them and that a majority of these deputies should elect the queen it seemed probable to thinking minds however that this scheme like most feasible in theory would present some difficulties when it was to be put in practice but of these the old queen never troubled herself to think she had provided against any immediate disturbance by choosing her own successor and she left posterity to take care of itself queen claudia was one of those fainéant sovereigns of whom it is extremely difficult to write the history for the simple but unanswerable reason that they never perform any action worthy of being recorded but as she seldom did any harm though she did not do much good she contrived to escape either violent censure or applause and in short to get through life very decently without making much bustle about it she continued the same counsellors that had been employed by her predecessor appointing the sons when the fathers died to save trouble she left the laws as she found them for the same reason and in short she let the affairs of government go on so quietly and so exactly in the same routine as before that for two or three years after her accession the people were scarcely aware that any change had taken place end of chapter one <laughs> an important question to uh, ask everybody who watched did you like this episode are undecided on this episode or Tom Cruise <laughs> oh.